What a Wonderful Song presented by father and daughter, Mr. Dakila and also Onyx. Thank you so much. When they were singing, I could see that for the, mad, for the father, the daughter is a gift of the lifetime, and for the daughter, the father is a gift of a lifetime. And for all of us, salvation is a gift of the lifetime. Praise the Lord. And working in Adventist institution also is a gift. I taught the book of Revelation several times when I was still part of the Ayas Seminary, but never I connected it with Adventist education. Now, after working more closely in the realm or the era of Adventist education, I read it more richly. Let us bow heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the gift of the lifetime. Thank you for your grace and love. Thank you for the joy of salvation and the joy of serving you. Father, we would like to be reminded by your words to help us understanding and position ourselves in your work. Thank you so much, Father. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Laodicea and Adventist education. Since I have started last night by mentioning how many slides I have, let me just continue doing it. This time I have only 51 slides. So there is a declining numbers. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira or Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These are the names of the seven churches as described in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. As I read these two chapters, with a spectacle of education, then I could see some indicators of an emphasis on education. And I will take some examples. Perhaps you may discover even more. So concept of education in the seven churches. When I read this name, Jezebel, I think it has something to do with education. Revelation chapter 2 verse 20 says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. When the Bible says that Jezebel was teaching, it means Jezebel was a teacher. And she might have a school of prophets, but false prophets. Because there are hundreds of them. They might have gone through certain training. According to the Bible, 2 Kings 22 verse 6, Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together about 400 men and said to them, this is King Ahab, the husband of Jezebel. Ahab asked them, shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight or shall I refrain? So they said, go up for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Just imagine that 400 people can have a very good choir to say, yes, you can go. There was no one who said, you shall not go. 
They have been trained to say one thing in harmony, although that one thing is wrong. What a training that they have underwent, undergone. In verses 7 and 8, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But what the king said? But I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. That's why the king always invites only advisors that will say good things about him. If an advisor is not saying good things about the king, the king will never call. So the king will always do what he really wants to do because the advisors or these prophets, for hundreds of them, would simply give a rubber stamp for whatever the king desires. But Jehoshaphat said to King Ahab, let not the king say such things. So Micaiah, according to this story, the story actually still continues, is a true witness among 400 false prophets or a true witness against the 400 false prophets. And we know also from the story of the Bible, Elijah played similar role because he served as a true witness against 450 false prophets. It seems to me that from the life of Micaiah and Elijah, we can understand the statement of Ellen G. White from Education, page 57, that says, The greatest want of the world is the want of men, in a generic term, men and women. Men who will not be sought, sorry, be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. This concept of the greatest want of the world is presented in the Bible and Mrs. White really elaborate or reaffirmed it in this statement. We know that there were schools of prophets during the time of Elijah and also the time of Elisha. And uh, there was a need of the school of prophets because during the time of Elijah, Elisha, there were so many false prophets. If they did not establish school of prophets, then there were, be only, there were only school of false prophets and there was no school of the true prophets. So Elijah and Elisha were prominent leaders of these schools of prophets. The Bible gave us hints that during their time, there were the following schools of prophets, and that is school of prophets in Bethel, school of prophets in Jericho, school of prophets in Gilgal, and school of prophets in Samaria. So when the book of Revelation in the message to the church of Thyatira mentioned this woman, Jezebel, it has something to do with education. Education that is offered in the context of the great controversy. When the prince of darkness, like Jezebel, works very hard through education, God wants his church to do its best through Adventist education. 
we are really, I would like to re-emphasize this. We are offering Adventist education in the context of the great controversy. Now let us see another concept of education in the messages to the seven churches. I believe we know this name, Balaam. Revelation 2 verse 14, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak, Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Jezebel was teaching and Balaam also was teaching. What was the teaching of Balaam? We know the story that Balaam was hired or was invited or bribed by King Balak to curse the people of Israel, but he could not do that because God was in control. But although he was in failure, that he could not do what was expected by King Balak, he had another idea. And that is mentioned in Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel, through the advice, through the teaching of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So what happened was that what Balaam could not do directly through his utterance to destroy God's people, he managed to do it through education. You can see that education is very powerful even from the hand of Balaam, a false prophet. And that caused destruction and that caused sin, great sin among the people of Israel. One more example of the concept of education in the seven churches. We have this church, Ephesus, the Ephesians, Christians in Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know your works, says Jesus Christ, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. They have a very good skill to discern, to test which one is a true apostle, which one is a false apostle, which one is a true prophet, and which one is not a true prophet or a false prophet, which one is a true teacher, and which one is, is a false teacher. They can really discern, they can test, they have a very high level of intellectual or intellect. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4, nevertheless, Jesus said, I have this against you that you left your first love. They are very knowledgeable, they are very skillful, they are very smart. But these Ephesians are smart, but loveless. They have sharp analytical capacity. They have high intellectual power, but very superficial spiritual life. Verse 5, remember therefore, Jesus says, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. If there is an institution like the church in Ephesus in which academically it is very good but it has lost the love of Jesus Christ and the sense of calling, then it is time to revisit the vision and mission of that education institution. 
whether they are still aligned with the vision and mission of the church. It is time to reevaluate the reason or purpose of the existence of our schools, whether they are still uplift or lift up the philosophy and values of Adventist education. Perhaps it is good if someone can make a very simple research of our Adventist elementary or high schools and from time to time we'll see the changes of the mission statements and the changes of the vision statements and to see after 30 years compared to the first the original mission and vision statement whether there is a major change why one word is replaced with another word why a strong word is replaced with one that is very soft why a clear statement is replaced with one that is very diplomatic it is time to reassess the effectivity and performance or of our education institutions if they really produce graduates as expected in the graduate profiles of our Adventist institutions. Perhaps I will add one more concept of education in the seven churches. Concept of education in the seven churches, and this is in all the churches, all the seven churches. I think we are all familiar with this chorus at the end of each message to the church, right? What is this chorus? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. You have this from Ephesus, Smyrna, all the way to Laodicea. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I look this as an educational refrain or chorus. Let him hear. This is actually the words of Jesus. When Jesus gave parables in his teaching, and there are many parables, several of them in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said these words. He said, He who has ears let to hear, let him hear. When Jesus was answering the questions of the disciples of John the Baptist, and this is in the context of he was teaching. He said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We can find this in some other places in the Gospels. And the context is always that Jesus was teaching. Therefore, this statement, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches is an educational refrain or chorus. The same phrase is also emphasized in Revelation chapter 13, verse 9. In the central part of Revelation, it means there is a lesson that we need to learn, whereas education is seen in the context of the great controversy. We know that the task of the Holy Spirit is indeed to teach. And that is what the Bible says, that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, says Jesus, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the task of the Holy Spirit is to teach. And this enriches the concept of education in the messages to the seven churches. Let us take some implications. By the way, implications does not mean conclusions. Because we are still on slide number 20. Jesus has taught since the early church until the last period of the church. If we believe that the seven churches represent the journey of the Christian church from the first century until the coming of Jesus. He has taught from the time of Ephesus until the time of Laodicea. This tells us that education is very important for God's church. 
it is even much more important in the end times, and that is our time. Leaders of the church are involved directly in education. The messages to the seven churches are addressed to the angels of those churches. The rebukes of negligence is addressed is addressed to the angels of the churches as well as to the members. English teachers, please forgive me my English. We are responsible of the education work in our church. Another implication, education is offered in an awareness that Jesus is coming soon. How many times this message from Jesus, I am coming soon, I am coming soon, is repeated in the messages to the seven churches. And so we can connect the two, education and the coming of Jesus, that we are offering Adventist education in the awareness that Jesus is coming soon. As you know that there are patterns in the messages to the seven churches. First, you have the addressee. It means to whom the message is given. But I would like to change it to another term, and that is the assessed. Those who are assessed or evaluated. To the angel of the church in, and then you have the name of the churches. Could be Ephesus, Myrna, and so on and so forth. The next one, you will have description about the assessor. And who is the assessor? Jesus Christ. How do we know that he is the assessor? Because he made some observation and findings. I'm using some terminologies that are used in the Adventist Accrediting Association or AAA. Jesus says, I know your works. He is an assessor. And then he made some commendations. You are, you are, you are, you are good, you are good. I know your works. But then he would make also some recommendations. For example, I have few things against thee. Or I counsel thee. Ha, another mistake in English. I counsel thee. And then there is a promise of reward. He who overcomes. Then an appeal to compliance. He who has an ear, let him hear. And you will have all of this from the church of Ephesus all the way to the church of Laodicea. However, there would be some uniqueness as we come to the church of Laodicea. The messages are presented in an evaluative structure. They are packed or packaged in report, in a report from Jesus, the evaluator. Now let us focus to the church of Laodicea. What is the uniqueness of the message of Jesus Christ to the Laodiceans? Number one, there is no commendation at all. If I'm an administrator of an institution and an accrediting uh, 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 body would leave a report without any good things, what would I feel? There is no recommendation at all. Interestingly, while there was no a self-study, I think we are all familiar with this, there is no self-study made by the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamum, all the way to the church of Philadelphia. It is interesting that there is a self-study done or conducted by the church in Laodicea. What is a self-study? This is who they think they are and what they think they have done. Preparing a self-study requires a teamwork. And then we are all happy when the self-study is done and uh, 
the accreditation team would come and look at the self-study and conduct their evaluation. The Church of Laodicea conducted a self-study. This is the last period of the church before Jesus comes. We cannot escape from the fact that we are part of this church period before the second coming of Jesus. If Adventist education is integral or part of the Seventh-day Adventist church, then we are living in the period of this Laodicean church and we are offering Adventist education with some characteristics that are connected with the characteristics of the church of Laodicea. What is the self-study of Laodicea? Open your Bibles with you, although it is there colorful. What is the self-study of the church in Laodicea? This is what they said. I am rich. Isn't it a self-study? Financially, we are doing fine. Actually, we have surplus. The operating uh, capital is very good, and so and so forth. I am rich. I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. What a self-study. But then the assessor, the accreditor, comes, and that is Jesus Christ. And what is the observation and finding of Jesus Christ? What is his evaluation to the self-study of the church in Laodicea? You are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And so Jesus did not stop there. He's a very good assessor, accreditor. He gave the church some recommendations. And the recommendation is based on the observation and findings. Sometimes when you read a report of accreditation team, how come that they give these recommendations but there is nothing at all in the observation and finding? How do we understand that we really need to do this recommendation but they have not observed anything in our performance? But the, observ the recommendation of Jesus is in line or aligned with the self-study and the observation and findings. Jesus says, the visiting team recommends that you buy from me, from Jesus Christ, gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. According to the church in Laodicea, when they look at the recommendations of Jesus Christ and they reflect it in their self-study, well, in the AAA accreditation, there are three categories in response to uh, a fulfillment or response to the prior recommendation. And that is fulfilled, partially fulfilled, and unfulfilled to one recommendation. Do you know how they respond to the recommendation of Jesus? They said, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing. For them, everything has been fulfilled. But when Jesus comes, he changed the status. Everything is unfulfilled. And he gave these three recommendations. To buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. To buy white garments that you may be clothed. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And all of these are all major recommendations. We usually put asterisks for all major recommendations in the AAA. So Jesus put all asterisks for this recommendation that everything is major recommendations. 
And that is the self-study of Laodicea. Why do you think the church in Laodicea came up with such a kind of self-study? Because they did not depend on Jesus Christ. Because they have neglected the standard that Jesus gave. Because they lost of focus. And they have a superiority complex. As they look at their self, I'm better than that institution, we are better than that institution. Everything they are better. Everything they are the best. That is why, let me just very briefly mention, these 12 areas of the Adventist Accrediting Association, or AAA, in which in each area, whatever it may be, 12 of them, it is the value, the philosophy, the mission, the vision of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that is really emphasized. Let's take area number one. You see, history, philosophy, I think many of you have been part of the AAA visits or at least being part of the team that prepare for uh, AAA visits. Let's go with area number one, history, philosophy, mission, and objectives. Right at the beginning of the Criteria for Review, or CFR, the institution has clear and current broad, uh, sorry, board approved statements of philosophy, vision, mission, and objectives, and or core values that are congruent with seven-day Adventist mission and values and with the Adventist philosophy of education and are readily available to constituents, employees, and current and prospective students. Area number two, spiritual development, service, witnessing. The institution has an intentional, coherent, detailed, and current board-approved spiritual master plan which serves as the basis for the effective spiritual development of faculty. So spiritual master plan is not only for students, but also for faculty and staff. Area number three, governance, organization, administration. The board of trustees or council establishes policies that safeguard the seven-day Adventist identity and mission of the institution. Area number four, the financial operation of the institution is prioritized to support institutional mission and Adventist identity while safeguarding the financial well-being of the church. Area number five, programs of study. The institution demonstrates the implementation of seven-day Adventist philosophy of education and the meaningful integration of faith and learning throughout all disciplines and all course delivery modalities. Areas number six, faculty and staff. The institution's policies and procedures for faculty and staff orientation and development encourage and strengthen faculty support for the mission of the institution and of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Area number seven, library, resource centers, and technology. The library and its resources support institutional mission, the transmission of Adventist beliefs and values, and the spiritual development of students. Area number Eight, academic policies and records. The institutional policies clearly reflect Adventist identity and the core values of the institutions. Area number nine. You can see that the slides change very fast now. Area number nine, student services. One of the criteria for review. The policies and procedures of the student service areas align with institutional mission and values and with the Seventh-day Adventist philosophy of education. Area number 10, physical plant and facilities. The physical plant and campus facilities promote and support institutional mission, Adventist beliefs and values, and the spiritual development of students. Area number 11, public relations and external constituencies. Publications and productions generated by or within the institution evidence, breadth, quality, and alignment with institutional mission and values and with the philosophy of Adventist education. Area number 12, 
pastoral and theological education. The programs of study are congruent with the institutional and church mission and are aligned with the International Board of Ministerial and Theological Education requirements. So you can see that in all of the 12 areas, everything is about faith. Everything is about maintaining, preserving, safeguarding the identity of the church and its philosophy, mission, objectives, values. We have these overall recommendations. Five years without interim visit, five years with an interim visit, three or four years accreditation or probationary status or suspension or accreditation. I don't know what overall recommendation Jesus gives to the church in Laodicea. So how do we manage this? I'm talking not to an institution, but to every individual, including to myself. What shall we do? I would like to conclude with the last seven slides. Matthew chapter 25, verse 16 that talks about the response of the servants who have been entrusted with some talents or talents from the master. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Literal translation of this text, having gone, it means he would go immediately without waiting, without tarrying or delaying. Having gone, he who had received the five talents traded with them and made another five talents. Start immediately. Individually, when we would like to make a reformation in ourselves, if we think that we are living in the church period of Laodicea, and we need to make some reformation or renewal of life in our, for ourselves, we have to start immediately. Another counsel, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. I'm talking to the institutional level and also individual level. We start immediately. And we do it together because we cannot do everything by ourselves. Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Keep watching every day, therefore, that you do not know, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Prepare, start immediately, do it together, and prepare daily. I'm talking even about preparation for any accreditation visit from the government, from the church, and beyond that, for any reformation that we would like to have in ourselves. Prepare daily. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Follow what is written. Follow the standard. Matthew 23, verse 23. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Implement all. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown from you. Stay focused. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads. Because your redemption draws near. Be ready, he is coming.
Even for the coming of the accreditation visit or team, we are ready. How much more individually we would be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. May God bless us. Amen.